Okay, it's uh kind of cool down here by the lake today. I want to go inland. Let's go up the Gunflint Trail. Hey, that sounds like a plan. Let's go. Okay. Hey, Jay. Hey, Joe. I feel like doing some exploring. Oh, that sounds like fun. Let's hit the road, see where we end up. This is Exploring the North Shore with Joe and Jay. We are heading up the beautiful Gunflint Trail, which is I don't, one of my personal favorite places to go when I'm just looking for a way to get away and kind of escape, I guess you could say. That's a great way to put it. I'm right there with you. Um, it's probably my favorite place in certainly in Minnesota and uh, maybe one of my favorite places anywhere, actually quite frankly. It's a pretty, it's a unique, incredible place that still exists in this world. And I think if you have not experienced the Gunflint Trail yet, it absolutely needs to be on your next to-do list for your trip up north. So when I think about the Gunflint Trail, as we're starting to head up here now, I think about all the lakes, all the portage trails, all the hiking trails that are available up here, uh, all the unique characters that have lived and continue to live up here. Um, all the resorts, just the community. There's a whole group of people that make this Gunflint Trail have a certain feel, especially mm -hmm. the more you get to know it. I mean, on the surface, of course, it's the nature and the wild aspect, but then you get to know the people and that only adds to the intrigue. At least it certainly did for me. And there are some names that you're going to probably hear during this episode. We're going to swing by Chickwalk Museum. And there's a lot of the same families that have been here now for generations. So it's not only a place where you can come to visit, but people live up here. They have called it home for many, many, many years. And like you said, they've definitely created an atmosphere and it has a feel, a vibe up here. It totally has a vibe. Very different than anywhere else. And it's every time I come up here, I feel like I have a different experience. I meet someone different and I just really enjoy it. And it's usually quite a bit this uh, sometimes depending on what time of year, but it's usually quite a bit warmer. Uh, up here than it is down by the lake. So if you're looking for a little bit of heat, if it's uh, cooler down by the lake, you can always kind of head up the Gunflint Trail and that's exactly what we're doing today. So while we are driving up, it is about, I would say you, you drive about 30 minutes and then you've hit kind of the beginning of what is the Gunflint Trail. You're on the Gunflint Trail the whole time, but really the unique aspect of it starts about 30 miles up. Yeah, I mean, that's more or less because there's some cool spots you can turn off. Um, there's some trout lakes like down off Trout Lake Road, oddly <laughs> enough, as it turns out. Um, and there's some good camping there by like Kimball Lake. And there's a, a good camp on Mink Lake. And that's kind of an offshoot. So that that to me, when I get up there and even that George Washington Pines area, I kind of start being like, okay, going up the Gunflint. But yeah, when you get right around that mid trail area um, by Trail Center mm -hmm. and, you know, Hungry Jack, Poplar and all those places right in there. Uh, that's where, it, yeah, it's like, okay, this is Gunflint now. So I'm a big fan of history, as you know. So I do have a little brief history of the Gunflint Trail here. Well, it's the gateway to the Boundary Waters, mm -hmm. Canoe Area Wilderness, which you are quite familiar with. Yep, the um, east end of the Boundary Waters yeah. is where the Gunflint is. So this is kind of the gateway to that really pristine, untouched area. Um, it does carry a really rich history that dates, dates back several centuries. This was a hunting and trapping grounds for the Native Americans as well as the French voyagers. And the Gunflint Trail today is a paved road. It does have many permanent residents, visitors from all over the world. So many people travel on the Gunflint Trail as means to access the Boundary Waters, but also many more come to stay at the many lodges and get boats from the outfitters and just spend a day up here, which is what I like to do. And yeah, a big thing that people, you, you'll see it posted frequently online is the moose spottings. Yes. Well, people come to the Gunflint um, to hopefully spot a moose. A lot of people put that on their to-do list or wish list, rather, uh, is more appropriate maybe when they come to the canoe, air, you know, to the Boundary Waters yes. and to the Gunflint in particular. And maybe you will. It's all kind of chance, but there are some spots uh, where you know, it's you can, more likely to get you out of the car yeah. and maybe go looking for one. I would say go if you're able to go a little bit further back and you have a reason to take a side road that at least in my experience, that's when I've seen them more. However, people have been spotting them, especially recently, right on the Gunflint Trail, just chilling out, 
mm-hmm. on the trail, uh, which is interesting. I, like I said, I've come back up here quite a few times. I've only seen a moose back here one time, and that was the mo- most recent time before this one that I was back here, and I saw a mom and two babies. Nice. So, yeah, cool. it, it's always exciting. You see them, and you kind of have this moment of, oh, I really am seeing one of those things right now. Yeah. Oh, this is happening. Exactly. And I panicked and didn't record it until it was already <laughs> running away. From, they were already running away, so. I think, Jay, I've <laughs> seen, you know, I've seen them on the gun flint. I've seen them on side roads. I've seen them in my canoe. Um, and I think what it really boils down to is pure luck. Mm-hmm. Um, you can spend all day driving around looking and it's just going to be a matter of chance. So if you come expecting to see one, uh, you know, not. I'll go eight, 10 months and not see one. And then I'll see like three in a week. So just probably plan on not seeing one. And then if you do get to see one, it's a, a, a gift as opposed to being exactly. disappointed. Yeah. So you probably won't but you might so yep. you know take a chance come on up check it mm-hmm. out mm-hmm. uh now another interesting thing about well, i i didn't know this i decided to look up why they call it the gunflint trail i've never i honestly just haven't really put that much thought into it but mm-hmm. according to the chickwalk museum website the question has a two billion year old answer and it's a rock called chert yes. and that is a form of gunflint which is i also didn't know this but gunflint just ret- refers to any rock that will make a spark that mm-hmm. will then fire off a gunflint rough rifle. The voyagers and the natives discovered this gold mine, I guess you could say, of this rock on the lake now known as Gunflint Lake. Mm-hmm. And the reason it got that name is because they would take their pit stops there to reload on this stuff during their hunting trips. And they called it, I'm going to horribly mispronounce this. Hold on. Lac de Pierre of Fusil? <laughs> You were you were rolling there at first, <laughs> and then you the the hesitation Wait, cost you. Like, oh shoot! Okay, there's an S at the end of Pierre's, which is throwing me off. So Lac de Pierre's a fusel. Yeah. Huh? Lake, Did I do that? Anybody? Lake. I prefer to just say Lake of Stone Flint or Gunflint Lake. Yes, but I salute you for giving it an attempt. That's the English translation. That's not the fun French name. I think they should still call it that. We we should rename Gunflint Lake to Lake de Pierre's Arcandon. <laughs> so anyway, that is how the lake got its name. And mm. then, of course, the trail used to be just a, it was actually literally a trail. The trappers and the hunters would use it to get back here to find their, you know, meat. Mm-hmm. And then they paved it. Or well, Actually, they didn't pave it at first, but it did become an automobile road and it had many names its official name do you know its official name um highway 12 yes cook county highway 12 oh, yes. cook county <laughs> highway 12 so it's cook county highway 12 is the official name mm-hmm. of the gunflint trail but it got the nickname the gunflint trail because that's just what everybody local called it yes it, it, you know it, it has a nice catch to it, it right does. the gunflint trail mm-hmm. it is now paved yep from beginning to end and really pleasant drive actually we're just cruising along here it's a two-lane road one lane going in either direction not a fast-paced road there's some parts i think get up to 55 we're going 50 right now there's parts that are 40 and honestly what's the rush exactly so slow down drive slow and plus there's a lot of blind curves and in that off chance that you do come across that moose standing in the middle of the road you don't want to hit it and there's also deer and there's bear and there's you know Enjoy the drive. Yeah. Watch out for the wildlife. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like we're about halfway up now. I see we're coming up to the trail center. Are you hungry? Yeah. Now we're getting into this middle gunflint area. And I think, you know, before we go all the way up the trail, we'd better fuel up because uh, we're just getting started here. So yeah, let's pull into trail center. All right. Well, it's right here. So we're pulling in and we're going to go have ourselves some lunch. A little busy, but maybe we'll be able to narrate our food. S- Sarah <laughs> will get us loud. a table. All right. Well, here we go. I have ordered a strawberry rhubarb malt here at the Trail Center. And yes. Personally, I, I've already tasted it. How I is it? I thought it was amazing. <laughs> so, Joe, I'm going to let you take a taste. You're offering I, me I, a I'm bite of this give... strawberry rhubarb malt? It is the best thing. I, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think. I think it might honestly be the best thing I've ever had. Wow. So, I <laughs> want right. to see what you think. Um, I'll keep my expectations reasonable, <laughs> but uh, let's see what this is all about. I'm eating this with a fork, by the way. <laughs> Uh, just for the record. We only got one spoon. 
Oh yeah. Yes. See. There's a little. There's a little uh, tart from the from the, the rhubarb, rhubarb, and then the strawberry sort of balances it out. Yes. Why'd you take it away? Because <laughs> it's mine now. <laughs> you don't get it. You no. no, that's fine. It's very good. Yes. And uh, of course, Trail Center is known for partially, known for many things, but malts being one of those at the top of the list. I think whenever I hear about the Trail Center going, somebody's going to the Trail Center, mm -hmm. you know, somebody else always throws in, get a malt while yep. you're there. Yep. It's one of those must do's when you're on the Gunflint Trail. And now I fully, 100% understand why with this amazing strawberry rhubarb malt. Is this your first malt at Trail Center? I, I ooh, as an adult, yes. Wow. I do believe, I have been here before. I don't know how long ago it was though. We might be talking 90s. Yeah, wow, so, cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you're experiencing, I'm glad to be a part of this experience. It literally yeah, get is. your fork away, Joe. Like, <laughs> <in ten. laughs> cool. Glad I got this burger. That is a beautiful looking burger. What exactly did you get? Well, kind of a traditional bacon cheeseburger. Okay. But then here at Trail Center, you can do a thing California style. I guess that's, you know, an option other places too, but just adds the works, you know, pickles, lettuce, tomato, uh, mayo. And it takes your bacon cheeseburger to the next dimension, <laughs> which is what I've done here, along with my um, Chris cut cross cut fries. Yeah. What do you have going on? I'm okay. intrigued by your. These are no ordinary cheese sticks. I went off the beaten path here, and I got chicken fried cheese sticks. Chicken which is, fried. Like I'm, I'm assuming that it means it was fried in chicken fat. Mm. And it's amazing. It comes with this amazing gravy. And this is like, it's like thickly breaded. It's not like a thin kind of... Like, yeah, it's like a breading on a chicken strip. Yeah, it's it's really... And it tastes amazing. Wow. And what's this... Uh, what did you say about the sauce? Did you yeah, describe that? It. Yeah. Get in there, Joe. So what's this? Gravy? That's gravy. I'm gravy. Gonna, but it's, it's like really good gravy. Oh my gosh. This is wild. Are they really hot? Um... Oh. They're hot, but they're mm. not scorching. Mm. Right? Yeah. Now you're just sitting over there with your fries and your Coke, mm. all jealous of my malt and my... The only thing that would make this better is a bite of that malt. <laughs> no, that's no, fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I come up here in the winter and go ice fishing nearby here. Next time I'm totally ordering these on a winter when I'll be all cold and covered in snow and hungry. I'm getting a burger and those. And, oh, you're going deep. Yep. Cool, thanks for sharing, Jay. Oh, yeah. would you like a fry? <laughs> <laughs> Not, I have these, I don't need fries. We're yeah. good. Cool. All right, so we're just gonna eat our lunch and mm -hmm. then carry on with our day. So we'll be back. Jay, back on the road now great lunch for trail center and that's like just if you're looking to clock that on the odometer first of all if you're going up gunflint trail it'll be on your left trail center i mean you can't miss it really but it's 30 miles approximately up from grand Marais to trail center that's kind of this hub epicenter on poplar lake of of just places to you know there's some resorts lodges the center of activity there in the mid trail area but now we're rolling on and we're getting into an area uh, north of there and it's like Iron Lake. You'll see uh, Iron Lake and there's Mayhew on the right here. And so we're getting into now an area that was burned in the Ham Lake fire of 2007. Um, that was a wildfire that uh, swept through the Boundary Waters and burned up a lot of acres in Minnesota and Ontario. Um, just a, a major event on the Gunflint, certainly to say the least. And you can still see some of the burned trees and the regrowth is now coming in it's pretty yeah. lush um you know if, now it may be if you were to, first time up the trail uh you might not even notice or think you you tell something there happened gets but... to like a point where all of a sudden the trees are a little bit smaller and the ones that are standing still quite taller don't have leaves on them they're just the like the kind stump of black basically and yeah stump. yeah i remember coming up a few years ago even and it was dramatically different so it's it's kind of insane how quickly nature has taken back this land indeed and it's also made for some awesome blueberry picking mm. um, 
Um, another event, Jay, that I wanted to talk about that's actually the two are kind of linked together, the Ham Lake Fire and then this other event known as the Blowdown Storm. And that is a huge event that happened in 1999, so 20 years ago. Actually, now this summer on July 4th of all days. Yeah. Uh, swept through across, so started in Fargo and swept east across northern Minnesota and the kind of the heart and center of this whole storm was the boundary waters knocked down you know millions of trees and just was a huge huge event and it just was basically a storm front that passed through with unbelievably powerful winds and blew down trees hence the, yeah. the blow down that name i heard 25 million trees yeah and that's Something you wrong? know wow. that's what the forest service estimates and it just was you know for those people who experienced that storm it's a big story telling and you know it's just a life experience for yeah. a lot of people well i can just imagine you're you're with your family you're back in the boundary waters ha having what you think is going to be a nice fourth of july warm weekend on the lake and all of a sudden the storm just rolls in and i don't know if people had that much warning it was gonna no. i don't think anybody knew how serious it was going to be mm -hmm. and it just is down upon you and there's nowhere to go you're stuck back there yeah so trees falling all around campsites remarkably nobody died in the boundary waters in that storm there were some serious injuries and some people had to be evacuated out and uh, in major devastation but um and then just a lot of rain it was a huge weather event 20 years ago and uh, i say the two are connected because all these trees that blew down died and they eventually became essentially fuel for this ham lake fire uh the cavity lake fire also at the end of the gunflint area some other on the west side of the boundary waters but the blowdown you know made all this kindling in the forest and then if there was a spark or a fire that came through it all, all ignited. In flames. so that's some some major major weather events that have happened in the last 20 years mm -hmm. up up the gunflint and it's kind of become part of the culture that people come together and it's just all part of the story of the trail yeah and, and you know i was not too far from here i was only maybe an hour and a half away from here on the fourth of july in 1999 i don't remember it mm. yeah. <laughs> i That's was i was trying i talked to my mom and i'm like do you remember the storm well she was in north home which is on the border of atasca and kuchichin county which kind of the, the storm rolled over they're not quite in its most severe state but yeah. It did hit that area, and she said it was terrifying, and she was inside of a house. Hmm. And I just, I, I I have zero memory of it. Wow. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> and uh, if you were up the Gunflint Trail, if you talked to somebody oh, on yeah. your trip up here, mentioned them blowing on, if they were there, the odds are they're going to have a story to share, and it's probably going to be pretty intense or interesting. So uh, that's all part of the history of the Gunflint, and, and Chickwalk has a lot of of those uh stories you know told and captured in either photos or video or just uh some type of a place so we're headed there to chickwalk to check some yeah. of that out and it's at the end of the gunflint it makes for a perfect uh day something to do so uh, kind of a destination if you will so when we hear back from us we're going to take uh just a quick rehearing back when we finish driving this last 20 miles or so we'll be at chickwalk I was here last year and I don't recall seeing this building at all. So Chickwalk is growing. Um, so just quick history while we're strolling towards the actual museum. I like this new sign. We got to find out who made those signs. They're really nice actually. And there's, there's that big one out by the Gunflin Trail. So you'll see a big sign that says um, you know, Chickwalk Museum. Yeah. And then you turn that way. So we're at Sag, Sag Lake. Deepest lake on the Gunflint Trail. Deepest lake in Minnesota. <laughs> Deepest lake in Minnesota, that's right. So, fun fact there. But this is a the Chickwalk Museum and Nature Center. So the main museum building is the historic Chickwalk Lodge, which was built in 1934. And at its peak had like 11 cabins and the central lodge and all this other, you know, Gunflint Trail-y stuff. Oh, there's like a little sitting bench area over here i also don't recall seeing last year so they're really i think they're adding on to it maybe we can go check that out yeah so uh it was closed in 1978 and it was sold to the u.s forest service and the u.s forest service basically just didn't do anything with it i think it was office space off and on and a few other little things were used in there and it wasn't until 2010 when they turned to the Chickwalk Museum. So it's sat empty for 30 years. Yep. Which is 
sad because this is kind of prime real estate. Uh, so the actual museum itself sits on 50 acres, includes a series of nature trails, the nature center building, the main museum building, and I, I, I noted in here that it has some new buildings and I believe that's what it was we just passed. We are walking towards the main building because we're going to chat with Bonnie here in a few moments, but definitely want to double back and check out what's new here. Look at that old boathouse. So Let's many see. cool things they have here. It says property of the United States on the gun. Right. So yeah, this, I mean, the building I believe is still owned by the U.S. Forest Service. It's just operated as a museum. And the museum itself focuses on the last hundred years of the Gunflint Trail. People started really coming up here and homesteading and living here year round. Have you been, you've been to the museum, right? I have, yes. Yeah. So as you know, the front half kind of features a lot of stuff about the local ecology, like animals, plants, things like that. Whereas the back half focuses on the people that lived up here. It's a large parking area and where you think you may want to park. Jay Keep and going. I took the scenic route because we <laughs> are uh, walking off some of our lunch. Yes. Our delicious lunch. It's a very heavy lunch. So let's see, it's, it's July 5th when we're recording this and I'm walking past the nature center and they have about three, it looks like, activities planned for today family-friendly activities so they have things like um, demonstrations and talks and naturalists come in and do things there's also another building back here and i don't know if i've ever seen that before maybe they'll let us in maybe all right so we are now here at the main lodge building of chickwalk museum and we'll be back in a few moments Well, for those who, for someone who has never been here before, we're standing where right now? We are in the Chickwalk Museum. And actually, this building is 85 years old this year. Oh. So it was built back in 1934, a uh, stone structure. The first one that was actually built here on property was in 1932 on this site. And back then, people would come here and eat their meals. It was like American style or American plan. And so none of the cabins had any kitchens in them. So all the guests had to come into the main lodge here and eat their meals. And they just built this beautiful log cabin in 1932. And they were unpacking all the dishes. And we actually have some dishes here that do say Chickwalk. Oh. And so they were unpacking their dishes. They had the papers laying everywhere. And then the dog came in, knocked over the oil lamp and burnt down the brand new lodge. Oh no. So, and that was in 32. Uh, so then they had to be resourceful, of course, during the depression. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So they collected all the stone from this building around this area, and including the fireplace too. It's been all collected from the end of Sagnaga Lake, up on Sagnaga Lake. Um, then they got some out of work local stone masons to come up from Grand Marais. And that's the structure that we have today. And we have some amethyst and some quartz in our fireplace. And there is some spots up on oh, Sagnaga yeah. that, that you can find some amethyst. Really? Yeah. My goodness, like I'm in <laughs> Thunder Bay or something. Yeah. I've, yeah. I, it's funny because I have been here a few times now and I've never noticed the amethyst on oh, the fireplace. Yeah. And there's another wow. big chunk over You can there. find amethyst on Sag? Yes, you can. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joe's going to come hang out at Sag more. There's a secret. There's a spot? Yeah, there is. Well, don't reveal Once it. Once we're done uh, with <laughs> yes. this. Once yeah. I'm no longer recording sound. Yes. Oh my yes. goodness. Yeah, there is a spot there's up there. The stuff. secrets of the Gunflint Trail. Yeah, there's okay. so many. Amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, every little glass window pane that you see is actually original. Uh, when they did restore the building, they had to take out every single pane, reglaze mm -hmm. it, and put it back in. Jeez. And, and there's what, 15 panes per window? Yes. Yeah. And there's a lot of them. Yeah. 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 Wow, mm -hmm. that's that's a job, but. But yeah, this building has been still standing here since 1934. Uh, they had 11 cabins on property. And when the Forest Service took over in 1980, they actually dismantled the 11 cabins and auctioned them off. But I'm thinking, because this was built out of stone, that mm -hmm. they probably would have had a, got a bulldozer maybe in here. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what saved it. And thankfully, it is still here to this day. So we wow. have this beautiful building to house the museum in. Yeah. And it used to be the nature center because that was before we built our nature center. And now that we have our nature center that opened in 2016, that is just the perfect place for families and even just individual people come and get some information about what they're seeing, like maybe some type of flower that they're seeing mm. or 
what is this tree I'm looking at? What is this bush? And we have all that resource down there that all people right. can so come up and explore. snap a picture and then come up here. And exactly. Yes. Is this berry edible? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a good one. And now we've added, oh, let's see, we have three trail cameras on property. Oh. So we've been getting a lot of neat photos from our trail cameras. What are you finding? A lynx. We've oh. had the lynx uh, four times now on camera. There's only like 250 of those. Is that it? Out here, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's wow. been one that we've been having on our camera. Uh, one was 9.20 in the morning. I was here at 9 in the morning, and it was just across the bay over here. They got it captured on the camera. Wow. Hmm. But and I think there's two different ones, because there's one that's a little bit bigger, and then the second one looks a little bit thinner and smaller. So I wonder hmm. if one's a male, male and female? one's a female. Oh. I don't know. Maybe we'll have more than 250 soon. Yeah, I know. I wish there was been some little ones kind of yeah. going uh, with maybe. it. Next year. And then last okay. week, we had a mama and her baby moose just kind of sitting in the water over here. The mom was fully engulfed in the water. Mm -hmm. She was just laying down. I think maybe the bugs were bothering her or yeah. something. And then the baby, he was just munching on the shore. He, mm -hmm. They hung around for a good hour, hour and a half. Mm -hmm. So that a lot of people got to see that. We've had a cinnamon bear around, a little coloration of the black mm -hmm. bear. He's been after the hummingbird feeder. <laughs> um, but other than that, yeah, he's just been kind of walking the trails. I'm sure waiting for the blueberries to ripen. Yep. yep. Oh, exciting times up here. I know, and a wolf. We had a timber wolf, too, oh, on the nice. camera. By himself? Jeez. By himself. Ooh. Nice size timber mm. wolf. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, so we've gotten a lot on the trail cameras. And those we all have down in the Nature Center, too, okay. photos of that. Yeah, great. And now, when I came here, in two, I think the first time I came here was 2015. It was just this building. And yes. now you have about five or six buildings. What's going on? Yes. Um, it's just the need. People are wanting more and more of the history or even the... The nature of what they're seeing and so we're trying to kind of we don't want to get too much bigger i think this is enough um because it's kind of hard to have too many outbuildings here it's kind of nice to keep it small but yeah the need people just want to keep more learning of the area and mm -hmm. stuff so we have an, an interpretive cabin per se and that's going to kind of show what american plan style cabin used to be like here on property and it's actually on the same location of one of the cabins that used to be here um, i believe it was called the judge's cabin i think oh. some judge used to stay there and so it was named the judge's cabin <laughs> but it's on the exact same footprint of where the other cabin was um, and that probably won't be open until next year but uh, we have some furniture in there right now but it's just going to basically be like a bed maybe a dresser a table and chair because they didn't have any kitchen in there but the view is spectacular you can go up and just sit on the front porch we have a couple rocking chairs there and just look down the corridor of Sagnaga oh. Lake, and it's just gorgeous, simply gorgeous. Yeah. And then we have, of course, our nature center. Yep. Uh, we also have an administrative building that houses our artifacts, as well as um, our break room for our volunteers and staff, <laughs> <laughs> especially on those cold days. Mm -hmm. And then we've added a watercraft exhibit building, which is the first building you come to now that you drive in on the left-hand side. It's a timber frame pavilion or timber frame building that um, North House helped us build. There was Ooh, a North House building. That's right. North House building. There was 16 people yeah. that volunteered and went down to North House in 2016. Spent about two weeks uh, building it or kind of getting the logs all set up. And then they didn't finally, they erected it up here in 2017, last 18. 18, sorry, the mm -hmm. years kind of go together. So it was 16, it was done in North House down in town. And then in 2018, it was brought up here. And then we finally opened it this spring in 2019. Right. And that houses a lot of the watercraft, canoes, motorboats, and even motors from the early days. And it just kind of shows how people were able to get around on the waterways up here and stuff. Wow. Um, yeah, we have canoes from Benny Ambrose, and mm -hmm. he was a gentleman that lived up on Knife Lake, kind of like the Dol Dorothy Mulcher of Ely. We had Benny Ambrose, and so we have his canoe in there. Uh, we have a Justine Kerfoot's canoe that she paddled a lot of her days. Um, Wayne and Phyllis Anderson, from locals from Grand Marais, they mm -hmm. actually donated a canoe and a paddle. So there's a lot of different older artifacts down in there that are kind of neat to look at and stuff too. Nice. And you are, it's a seasonal museum. So what Correct. are the dates? We are open always Saturday of Memorial weekend until the third week of October, which is MEA weekend um, is for the people that live in Minnesota and that know what it is. So yeah, usually about the third week of October, seven days a week, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then the other two buildings, it's 10 a.m. to like 4 p.m. 
Nice. And we mentioned that you have activities and things like that that are kind of pre-planned, so schedule on your website. Yes, and we do have our calendar on our website. During the hard part of summer, we have free Tuesdays, which are any kids can come up and they get free admission all day long. And then we have so many different activities. They can go down and catch a tadpole. They can go look for dragonflies, anything, make a journal. And that's Tuesdays, usually the end of June until like the middle of August. And kids are free all day long. The folks just have to pay for their admission. But Well, that's, you know, yeah. Yeah. makes it's it good. nice and affordable for it families. It does, yeah. And then they, they just learn so much, too. Yeah. And then the kids go back and, Mom, look what we made. And it's just very exciting. So who was Tommy Banks and Billy Needham? Um, well, Billy Needham actually lived up on, it was like a narrow strip of land between Hungry Jack um, Lake and West Bearskin Lake. And he was a bachelor and he just was a really all around kind of guy. He was a, a guide, a fishing guide, hunting, um, bachelor, just, and he carved uh, furniture out of Diamond Willow. And he, a lot of the furniture actually went to um, a lot of private residents in the area as well as um, some of the resorts. Oh, okay. Billy Needham um, was actually a neighbor and was a caretaker of Tommy Banks's cabin. Okay. And so that was the unlikely friendship. Did he know what Tommy Banks did? Probably, I would okay. think so. I mean, I couldn't imagine how you could keep something that quiet and stuff. But this is really cool. This is Tommy Banks' scrapbook. Oh. And I mean, yeah, he does have the newspaper articles of, you know, all the uh, kind of like when the police were on their raids and stuff. But I mean, he kept an Easter cart from his wife. To my husband at Easter with all my love. And then there's another one over here yeah. that says for my husband's birthday with my love. And so, I mean, even though he had a mistress, it's like he always, he kept, I mean, just, it was just amazing. The little things that he did keep, it was just that he was sentimental enough, but I don't know, kind of interesting. I think most gangsters kind of have that interesting part of them that you don't expect and you kind of find out about like, oh, that makes them, it almost makes you feel like Human. you can relate to them. Yes. And I think maybe that's why Tommy Banks was such good friends with him, you know, just yeah. because of that reason. It was like, yeah, he might've been a gangster, but you know, he was still a very, very good friend of his and stuff too. Mm. And uh, yeah, and we have his Colt revolver here cool. too. Um, and then some of the carvings, we got various also, um, Earl Niewald, um, some of these pieces are from him, and he actually used to be the District Forest Service Ranger in the area, and he did an interview with Billy Needham, and so we do have that also available. Um, and it just kind of talks, they just did a little interview with um, Billy and kind of talk about his life and how he thought some of the lakes got their names up here. And then we also have another carving. This one, Teresa Bauman had given us. We don't tell too many people, but it's um, it's a naked lady. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, <laughs> okay. she looks naked. And it's oh, quite sweet. interesting. So we kind of tuck her in a little and yeah. it's just funny. So the people that had known Billy, we kind of say, well, go look for the naked lady. And they're just like, what? Well, who's yeah. the naked lady supposed to be? Do you know I who that is? no idea. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. And he also, Billy Needham, actually carved, that's the very first totem pole that was at Clearwater Lodge. And he is the one that carved that totem pole. Hmm. And so that's kind of nice that we have that down there. right. In that's the where I've center. seen the name before. Because mm -hmm. when I saw the name, I'm like, Billy Needham. I'm like, I know I've seen that before yes. now. But yeah. OK, that's yeah. the totem pole. But yeah, so this is our temporary exhibit this year um, cool. that we have. Yeah. Are people liking it? They are loving it. They love the video. And actually, it was this, um, the grandson that created the video for us and then the um connells they donated all this equipment for us to have in our museum for future more displays and wow. things that's, and that's i know that is wonderful that they were willing to do that for us and then this map of course was hand-drawn billy need a map um and that's from bearskin lodge they mm. let us have that on loan this year too mm. but that kind of is there he had little handwritten notes and everything in there too pretty cool yeah, yeah. Um, another thing that we did this year actually is we're trying to um, highlight more local authors from the trail. And before we used to always have one of Helen Hoover and Justine Kerfoot. And so we now combine them into one. And now we want to every two years kind of get a different author out in the public and show, hey, there's a lot of other authors on the trail. So one is John Hendrickson, who has a cabin on Gunflint Lake. And the other was Calvin Rudstrom, and he had a cabin on Seagull Lake. Okay. So we have a little display, a new display of that. So we're trying to freshen up things in the museum a little bit too to keep people interested. 
Well, yeah, even this last year was the blowdown yes, information. Exactly. So this yes. being, yeah, yeah, and this is actually a very, very, very interesting, especially if you're into the, like the 1920s yeah. and the prohibition era mm -hmm. type stuff and knowing that even up here in the middle of nowhere, there is. it was happening up yes. here and it was, yeah. this was a part of that story. Yeah. Yeah, definitely to have, you know, information on both of them up here is really quite interesting. So is that... That's his wife. Tommy giving the oh, bunny ears to, to Billy. Billy? Okay. Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was quite tall. Um, uh, yeah. Tommy Banks and a bit of a character, it looks like. Yeah. So. Look at the, what do they call those? Zoot suits? Yes. Is that what they call them or yep. whatever? Not sure. With the hat and everything mm -hmm. and the tie. Thanks for having us, Bonnie. Oh, this well, is great. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please do. Go ahead and explore. And if you have any questions, just let us know. We'll do. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh. So we're heading towards the interpretive cabin right now. It's not open yet, but there is a sign, so. You know, sometimes I like to think about if I just wandered up here from Missouri or like Tennessee, and then suddenly you were here at this, like, don't you bet people are just blown away? I mean, I'm okay. blown away and I live here. I grew up here and I'm blown away when I come back here. I honestly, I did not spend much time at all on the Gunflint Trail as a kid, even though I lived nearby, it just wasn't something, my parents are not outdoors people. I think we went camping once when I was eight. Oh. Um, but yeah, so as an adult, I came back here and I spent three days back here nice. for work and it was amazing. And I just remember thinking it's, it's almost like you go into a different world for a little while, almost, a, even almost a different time period. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have cell phone reception. That's not the thing that you're doing when you're back here is, kind of un, uncutting and unwinding and just relaxing and oh look at the view though I mean this is a log cabin she said it was on the exact you know footprint of the original cabin and it's on the side of a cliff basically cabin on sag people come here I know some people who uh, travel just to sag and these are people that could go anywhere in the world that they would ever want to go and they come here and he's the owner of a very successful company he says my happy place in the world is on sag lake sag lake yes it's a big lake it uh oh it's huge half in and half out of the boundary waters half in canada half, half in, canada. in the u.s yep. deepest lake in minnesota with a footnote Okay. <laughs> Outside of Lake Superior, it depends if okay. you count Okay, well, Superior. Lake Superior isn't technically in Minnesota. Yes, it is. What do you mean? Of course it's it is. It's the border of Minnesota. Yeah, but it's still in. The whole thing isn't, though. It's just part of it. Well, either a sag. Oh, that's true. Ha-ha! <laughs> oh, so <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> that trivia question is incorrect. <laughs> well, it's, I th believe they said deepest <laughs> other than Lake other Superior. Other than Lake Superior, or okay. Or Inland Lake or something like that. Yeah. We share it. We share it with Canada. Yes, proud. Gladly. And Cascade Vacation Rentals has a house out here called Wearing Water. And that is one of the many properties available from Cascade Vacation Rentals, who is the sponsor of our here podcast. Yeah. If you would be interested in coming out to Seg Lake and staying just a very short distance away from Chickwalk here, you can do so by going online to www.cascadevacationrentals.com or by calling 888 eight six eight two nine seven two and use promo code podcast at checkout to get the current best discount we have available all right sounds good and the thing about that rental on sag for cascade vacation rentals you can literally see the sign for the boundary waters from the property from the dock yep. yeah from the dock and there's a you know there's a motorized zone so you can take a, a motorboat up this corridor it has everything you would want and it's yeah. a huge border lake and uh yeah of course you can go uh, right from here at Chickwalk and, and be in that same area so lots of good things happening up that way yeah so check out wearing water at cascade vacation rentals okay so now we're inside this nature center it's a little echoey but this is my favorite thing this the loon faux pond that's above your head yeah where the loon's hunting fishing nice oh there's all sorts of fun activities in here to do and different things are set out the rocks of gunflint trail amethyst i'm not seeing amethyst 
Does it tell you what they are? Oh, here we go. Find out. Where is, oh, they're chert number nine. So number nine is the reason. Gunflint chert. Is this nine? Oh, there it is. Huh. Cool, huh? All right, so this in my hand is how the Gunflint Trail got its name. And the reason people, well, not the reason people came back here, but the reason people came often to Gunflint Lake. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. You could learn a lot by coming to this <clears throat> museum. Adults. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, obviously there's arts and crafts projects that, oh, is that the Hand Lake Fire? Yep. So there's a TV screen is showing a series of pictures taken around the time of the Hand Lake Fire. This one looks like it was right after. And then there's some from the smoke billowing up taken from Seagull Lake of, oh, wow, look at that. Major destruction. Yep. But right. now there's all these blueberries. Is that what brought the blueberries? Mm -hmm. Oh, I did not know that. Yep. I learned something. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for stopping in, guys. You bet. All right. We are now doubling back to where we parked. I, I like that we actually parked way down here because it gives us the opportunity to double back. Yeah. Definitely bring a picnic to this place because yeah, picnic you could tables. Spend, and... What a day here! Oh, this is definitely a day. Yeah. All right. Well, we are at the next building now. This is the boathouse, and I do just want to glance in real quick. This is the new one they built. This oh, north this... house. Look at the porch. So the front porch is made up of instead of like bars just going down on the porch, it's little little paddles. Isn't that nice? So Justine Kerfoot bought this canoe that we're looking at in 1929. And at the time she didn't know how to paddle or portage. And her Native American neighbors then helped her as she developed the skills that lasted a lifetime and made her quite famous mm -hmm. on the Gunflint Trail. This is actually her canoe. This is a big deal that this is here. Looks like it's in really good shape for being like her canoe considering how much... She was out there. And Benny Ambrose, this guy actually lived. And he's one of the, him and Dorothy Moulter are the last two people that ever lived inside the Boundary Waters. Before they kicked them all out? Well, they got to live there until they yeah. passed away. And But everyone else, they got grandfathered in, basically. And so they were living in there even when it was the wilderness. He's from Iowa. He really? ran. He ran away from home. And uh, wound up in the boundary waters pretty much, wow, like later and through the yeah. course of his life. But this was where he felt it at home and at peace. And he, yeah, he, he was uh, quite a character. He looks like it, yeah, it's like a very interesting person. I think he that's a good way to describe it. And I mean, you have to admire the North House construction timber frame methods. This is awesome, thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, that's worth checking out. If you, if you have been to Chickwalk before and you haven't seen the boathouse, the newest addition, it's worth a trip, especially if you're into canoeing, as many people are around here. I think I would suggest starting in the main museum and kind of learning some of those names mm -hmm. and who these people are. There's a lot of information about them in there. And then going around the property and seeing those names over and over, because it's a lot of the same people on the gunflint for the past hundred years and they're now their kids and their kids is kids. Hey, great time at Chiqua. All right, let's head out. It's getting a little bit late. And even though I, I think we usually do a few more things on these episodes because a lot of the gunflint trail is the drive and mm -hmm maybe getting out of your car and hiking around a little bit and just experiencing the nature aspect of it. Not rushing is kind yeah. of a theme of the trail. There's no reason to be just zooming around to try to fit in so much. It takes a, a little bit of time to do the gunflint ride, days kind of. Yeah, I mean, you could obviously come up for a day and just pick one or two things to do, or you can come up for a week. You could probably even come up for two weeks mm -hmm. and find something different to do or have a different experience every day. Yep. Just drive around, get a canoe, paddle mm -hmm. around, go fishing, mm -hmm. have 
you know, a amazing strawberry rhubarb malt at yes. Trans Center. <laughs> With a fork. With a fork. I suggest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or you can, you know, do some camping. You could do a mix and match of a place at a, a cabin one night and then, or, you know, anywhere along the trail or in town and come back and forth, uh, do some day trips into the Boundary Waters. You don't always have to go overnight um, and do, you know, more of an extended trip where you're hauling gear and setting up camp. You can come in and out of the wilderness. They issue free day permits. So that's just another option. And then, of course, all the hiking trails. Mm -hmm. like Now, you were telling miles. me about your favorite hiking trail. Yeah, well, the, my favorite would be the Border Route Trail, which is a long and somewhat strenuous and kind of difficult to follow in places. So for a beginner, it's kind of a more, that's more of a, extended hike i guess but for shorter hikes like caribou rock trail is a perfect day hike and and it too has some up and down but it's uh moderate to maybe moderate difficult but uh, you can hike it all the way from hungry jack road up to rose fall the stairway portage and rose falls on the canadian we border might have to do basically that <laughs> and the border's out in the lake a little ways but it's a it's a beautiful hike and it's just a, you know matter of a few miles um, the South Lake Trail is kind of an underrated trail. There's the Crab Lake Spur Trail, which is on the east side of Loon Lake. And then that connects to the Border Route Trail to another set of falls. Oh. Um, so there's some great short, of course, Magnetic Rock yes. uh, is kind of the most popular and, all, and for good reason. It's, it's pretty, I, you know, that's the one trail I actually have been able to mm -hmm. do while up here. And it's pretty easy. I think it's mm -hmm. three miles round trip, something like that. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a beautiful hike and then magnetic rock itself is quite the sight to see. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And so I guess the point we're trying to make is there's a lot of things to do. Um, Chick Walk is a great family destination or for a couple on a rainy day, something, if you're just looking to, you know, learn a little more about mm -hmm. the trail even. Uh, but we didn't want to sell you short listener of our podcast because um we wanted to spend some more time getting up the trail and doing some getting out and hiking and doing some blueberry picking and some fishing which i'm yes. very very excited about so those will be another episode yes. coming up here in the near future on the podcast this was basically the quick easy day trip to the gunflin trail episode we'll yeah. get more in depth soon and until then we'll see you again all right thanks a lot <laughs> see ya bye Exploring the North Shore with Joe and Jay is brought to you by Cascade Vacation Rentals. With the largest selection of privately owned vacation rental homes and cabins on Minnesota's North Shore of Lake Superior, from Duluth to the Canadian border, use the promo code PODCAST to get the biggest discount currently available on your next day with Cascade Vacation Rentals. Book online at www.cascadevacationrentals.com or by phone at 888-868-2972. Some exclusions do apply.